What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. You know what it is. Thank you for joining me today. We're gonna break down the NFL head coaching moves. Uh, actually, all the, the coaching moves that will affect fantasy football, offensive coordinators, head coaches, all that kind of shite. Uh, I know there's been a lot of content already kind of published on this, but I wanted to wait until the dust settled down so I can give you the full, thorough breakdown of everything that's that's gone on thus far. Coaching was one of the big things that I needed to improve on coming into this year. I semi paid attention to last year, but not as thoroughly as I should have. And this year, that will not be the case. I will learn from my mistakes. I'm gonna break down all the coaching changes for y'all. If you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. New to the channel, subscribe. We're gonna be hitting you with fancy football content. This is basically all year round, baby. It's lifestyle now. So uh, sit back, tuck your shirts in, stop yelling, and enjoy the video. So there were eight head coaches that were fired. Cincinnati, Green Bay, Denver, Arizona, Cleveland, Miami, Tampa Bay, New York Jets, along with a lot of offensive coordinators. First up on the list, we're going to go alphabetical, and we're going to start with my squad, Dirty Birds. You know, they needed to switch things up, and I guess the front office decided Dan Quinn was still the guy for the job. Dan Quinn ended up letting go of Steve Sarkeesian, their offensive coordinator, the defense coordinator, special teams coordinator. So they let go of Steve Sarkeesian. And, you know, there were reports that, oh, we're going to get Todd Munkin, the former offensive coordinator of the Tampa Bay Bucks. I'm super excited. Uh, I see the report. I figure it's a done deal. The next day I wake up and it's like, yeah, we signed uh, one of the coaches from Tampa Bay. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's Dirk Cutter. And I'm like, fuck you, whoever initially posted that first report. So we ended up with Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter was the former Bucks head coach, not offensive coordinator. I hate Dirk Cutter. I think he was a horrible, horrible head coach. Here's the thing. Here's the thing to understand when you're breaking down coaches. There is a huge difference between being a successful offensive coordinator and being able to be a successful head coach. You see a ton of these offensive coordinators or even defensive coordinators have really, really, really successful stints in their jobs as coordinators, make the jump to head coach, and completely fail. That's like a very large percentage of people because not only do you need to you know, be able to implement the system that you did as your coordinator and put all the right pieces in place and the personnel moves and whatnot. But you also have to be, as Animal would say, a leader of men. You have to control the locker room. You have a lot more on your plate. So some of these guys just can't handle it. However, if you've had success as an offensive coordinator uh, and you go to a head coach and you come back as an offensive coordinator, you can usually find success again. So that's why I'm not too upset about this hiring Dirk Cutter, just because we've seen him uh, with the sample size as an offensive coordinator and even with the Atlanta Falcons already. So we kind of know what we're in for. And looking at this chart, these are Dirk Cutter's kind of previous stints. And he was an OC in Jacksonville for five years as he, that was his first stint as a coordinator. Then he was the OC in Atlanta for three years before moving over to Tampa Bay where he would be an OC and then the head coach for the last three years. And I wanted to look at um, his run pass ratios to kind of see what we can expect from this Atlanta offense in 2019. His time in Atlanta was extremely, extremely favored towards the pass. 67%, 70%, and 74% of the plays in his three years as the uh, Atlanta offensive coordinator were pass plays. Over the last three seasons, the Packers have led the NFL with a pass ratio of 64% over those three seasons total. So over the last three years, the Packers have led the NFL, thrown the ball in 64% of their plays. Atlanta under Dirk Cutter as the OC threw the ball in 67% of their plays, 70% of their plays, and 74% of their total plays. Unsurprisingly, you know, Matt Ryan and Julio Jones were awesome in that span for fantasy football. Matt Ryan finished as a top 10 fantasy quarterback in all three seasons. He threw for more than 4,500 yards in all three years. He averaged nearly 29 touchdown passes in those three seasons. Julio also balled out. He had his career high 10 touchdown receptions, which is like the only time I think he's going to sniff double digit touchdowns. Um, and the running back situation does make me a little bit nervous, not just from a, a cutter outlook, but Atlanta overall, and just what we see in that backfield right now, right? Freeman coming off of back-to-back um, injury-plagued seasons, and it's worth wondering if his, if his time is like a solid fantasy option or 
kind of over. I know a lot of people are going to be um, looking at him as a bounce back candidate and thinking he's a great value. We'll have to see. I'm not as confident as I normally would be. No running back under Cutter as the OC in Atlanta had more than 190 carries in any single season. Even while he was coaching guys like Michael Turner, Steven Jackson, the fucking stallions that we had down there in, uh, in, in dirty Atlanta. So I would say Freeman is probably someone left being undrafted in the first four rounds of redrafts people are probably going to get cute and start to think of him you know late third round fourth round i'm probably going to let him slide if not julio going to be top five fantasy wide receiver as he always is matt ryan is another excellent late round quarterback he finishes i think quarterback three in fantasy this year and he'll probably get drafted somewhere in like the eight to ten range just because that's how these random guys that look like matt ryan end up getting drafted they all get kind of thrown into the same spot so ryan if he falls into that later range it's going to be great dirt cutters a guy who loves to throw the ball we saw it in tampa bay as well so um looks good for julio looks good for matt ryan looks good for calvin ridley austin hooper all those guys let's move on to arizona now this one's gonna you know this this one might take a while i got a lot of breakdown here so like i said sit back tuck your damn shirts in stop yelling and enjoy this breakdown right they had steve wilkes for a year hired him as head coach fired him. Mike McCoy got canned, um, I think with like four games or actually like midway through the season last year ish. Byron Leftwich is also gone out of Arizona. So everyone that was somewhat involved in the offense in Arizona last year is gone, thankfully, because that was the worst fucking offense I've ever seen in my entire life. But Cliff Kingsbury has officially signed on to take over the Josh Rosen project in Arizona. Kingsbury was fired from Texas Tech. He eventually signed on to be USC, yes, the college, USC's offensive coordinator, uh, about like a month ago, I want to say, and then he got offered the job in Arizona, and he took that job, which is amazing, man. It It, it is just a great reminder what being good-looking gets you in 2019. Just keep your Instagrams up to date, fam. You never know where it will take you. Fired from Texas Tech to NFL head coach. His girlfriend is smoking hot, but we're here to talk about fantasy football, sorry. Kingsbury's time in college was spent at Houston, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, none of which were powerhouses, but he's coached a handful of NFL quarterbacks, uh, some very, very, very prominent ones that have kind of broke out in the last few years, Baker Mayfield, Patrick Mahomes, Davis Webb, who obviously is not as popular as those other two, but just the fact of, uh, you know, coaching these non-powerhouse college teams and having all these NFL caliber quarterbacks on the team is interesting, if not just a coincidence. But looking at this chart, kind of what I did with Dirk Cutter, I wanted to look at 2013 to 2018. Those were his years at Texas Tech. And for the first four years or so, he was around the 60 to 63% passing mark. And that was probably because he had the duo of Baker Mayfield and Patrick Mahomes as his quarterbacks. They were running a a ton of plays here. Um, And then that kind of scaled back a little bit over the last two years as you had some unknown uh, names at quarterback. Now, his offenses have always been very high-powered. They have ranked inside the top 23 in the NCAA in five of six seasons in terms of total offense, including two top five offenses, unsurprisingly, the two years uh, that Patrick Mahomes was the unquestioned starter at quarterback. Now, Cliff Kingsbury, the, the, the reason that people are kind of excited about this offense and seeing what happens with it is he runs an air raid style of offense. And at the very basic level, FF Statistics... Uh, the creator of FS Statistics, Addison Hayes, joined me on the channel last week. So if you missed that that episode, it was, uh, it was actually a very good, very informative episode. I will link that up here. He did a great job summarizing um, in their Cliff Kingsbury article what the Air Raid offense actually is. So quote unquote, he said, the Air Raid offense is known for its heavy emphasis on passing. Typically, four wide receivers are used, two line up in the slot and two line up wide. Passing plays usually number around 65 to 75% of all the plays run in a given game. The air raid also usually involves the no huddle or hurry up working to tire out the defense. Now, 65 to 75% is a very, very high percentage of passing plays, which I don't expect them to hit that number. Looking at the last two years of him at Texas Tech, they weren't close to that number. And like I said, over the last three years, the Green Bay Packers have led the NFL in terms of their percentage of plays being passed at 64. So to expect 65 to 75, I think is a little bit out. Landish, but I think if he's in an offense where he's comfortable with his quarterback, hopefully he gets a good chemistry with Josh Rosen, then you will see the upper percentage of those numbers. Now, something I did notice when I was looking back at those college teams that he ran at Texas Tech, you see these names here, Jakeem Grant and Kiki QT. Those guys are slot receivers, and those guys had fantastic seasons under Cliff Kingsbury. Jakeem Grant, 
Three years, very productive, ending with a blast in his final year. Kiki QT, same thing, 93 for 14, 44, and 10 touchdowns. FF Statistics said that they like to use two slot wide receivers and two outside wide receivers. Uh, I would assume this is to, you know, get the ball out quickly, get the ball downfield, and and get the ball moving, you know, in a much quicker pace than we saw in 2018. Fitzgerald re-signed with the Cardinals this offseason. One year, $11 million. Hard to say what will happen here, but it would be cool to see both Christian Kirk and Fitz in the slot. If they are running four wide receivers and two of them are in the slot, those two would probably be the two guys that would uh, take on those positions. Kirk was quietly having like a nice little breakout rookie year before ending up on the IR after starting just seven games. Both could manage to definitely be wide receiver three slash flexes, I think, in fantasy next year, considering they're not going to be in fucking Michael McCoy offense. What does Cliff Kingsbury signing on to the Cardinals head coaching job mean for David Johnson? It's very hard to say. It's hard to say, um, but I'd imagine anything is an upgrade compared to what we had last year. I think the play of Josh Rosen and their offensive line will dictate about how high his ceiling is going to be in 2019. Cliff Kingsbury did say, I can't wait for our offensive coaches to get their hands on him and use him in as many ways as possible. Talking about David Johnson. The O-line is going to be a big piece of how I see David Johnson faring because they were bottom three offensive lines in the NFL last year, um, and they actually were bad the year before as well. So they're going to really need to upgrade that position. Now, they do have the 11th most cap space available, so that will probably be something they do. If he's comfortable with Josh Rosen, they'll probably move back in the draft from the number one overall pick move back somewhere uh, later in the first round, grab some offensive linemen and build around that. Now, this whole situation is definitely a long shot, in my opinion. Klingsbury is uh, is unproven at the NFL level, obviously. The problem may have been Steve Wilkes, but it also may have been Rosen. And for the most part, you want to give these rookie QBs the benefit of the doubt, like Jared Goff or whatever. But Rosen was pretty awful on just about every level, although he had no protection up front and not a lot of weapons, considering Fitzgerald was old and aged. Christian Kirk only played in a handful of games. So um, I will give this a clean slate and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what the Cardinals do in 2019 here. So we'll move on to the Cincinnati Bengals where they had Marvin Lewis after fucking 38 years. They finally let him go. Bill Lazier, offensive coordinator, gone. It's shocking, right? The Bengals didn't want to go seven and nine again. I don't know why they wouldn't want to do that, but they ended up cutting ties with Marvin Lewis, who has a regular season record of 131, 122, and 3 since coming on board in 2003. I didn't realize that it had been that long when I first started researching this. I didn't realize he'd been the coach in 2003. More importantly, or unfortunately, if you're a Cincinnati fan, his playoff record is actually an impressive 0-7 at this point. Since the Rams are still in the playoffs, right, they're going to the Super Bowl this weekend, uh, the Bengals can't hire their soon-to-be coach, Zach Taylor, who is expected to take over as the coach. He is, or he was, the Rams quarterback coach. A year after being their assistance wide receiver coach, he's 35 years old. Now, I'm not going to make the played out joke that like anyone who comes in contact with Sean McVay becomes a head coach, but that's, you know, that's what the theme of this offseason has pretty much looked like. Every team is trying to hire the new, young, offensive-minded coach. Um, most of this shit makes no sense to me. So they have a guy who was an assistant wide receiver coach, moved to quarterback coach, and now he's moving straight to the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. They also brought on the Raiders quarterback coach or are bringing on the Raiders quarterback coach, Brian Callahan, as their offense coordinator. So their offense is going to be run by two guys who have never coordinated anything. They've never been offensive coordinators. They've never been head coaches. Um, so this could be a huge backfire on their part. Only time will tell. They need to upgrade that offensive line. We have to see, you know, how Andy Dalton recovers and if he's even their quarterback in 2019. What I will say is their offense over the last few years has been one of the slowest pace offenses in the entire NFL. Dead last in plays in 2017, 28th in number of offensive plays this year. A new offensive minded scheme will hopefully, you know, bring volume up in that sense. And that will be better for Joe Mixon. So Cincinnati Bengals, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Browns, right? They had Hugh Jackson, they had Todd Haley last year. They ended up firing them halfway through the year. Man, do I like what they are cooking up in Cleveland right now, though. They let go of Greg Williams, which I certainly think was the right move. He moves over to New York. The next man up and new head coach is Freddie Kitchens. Now, Kitchens started as the running backs coach there when those two guys were fired midseason. Hugh Jackson, Todd Haley, Kitchen moves up to the offensive coordinator position, although he's never called plays before, ever. He started in the league as a tight ends coach, was a quarterback's coach under Bruce Arians in Arizona for a while before becoming the RB's coach there, and then to Cleveland. And then this previous year happened, and now he's the head coach of the Cleveland Browns with a soon-to-be top-five quarterback. A great situation here. Clearly, 
him and Baker Mayfield had a fire connection and they did not want to let that go. Baker really, really, really liked him and the Cleveland Browns rewarded Freddie Kitchens for that. We look at the splits with and without Kitchens as the play caller here in Cleveland and this is Baker Mayfield's splits. Without Freddie Kitchens calling the plays, 58 percent completion percentage, 6.6 yards per attempt, 2.6 percent touchdown rate, 14 fantasy points per game with Freddie Kitchens calling the plays. 68% completion rate, 8.6 yards per attempt, 7.2% touchdown rate, 19 fantasy points per game, quarterback 10 in fantasy during that span. I expect Baker to be a top 10 fantasy quarterback in 2019. The biggest hire, in my opinion, for this staff was Todd Munkin as offensive coordinator. Man, did I fucking want him for the Falcons. Falcons grabbed the wrong Tampa Bay coach, as I already alluded to. Interestingly enough, supposedly Kitchens is going to continue to call the plays. We'll see how long that lasts, and we'll see how much of an imprint Todd Munkin has on this offense. Under Todd Munkin, the Bucks threw the ball 10-plus yards down the field on 30.9% of their first down plays. No one else in the NFL was above 23.7%. As we kind of figured out this year, running the ball in the first down is a horrible, horrible, horrible play call. Um, It is negative, as they would say, EPA. The forward-thinking coaches in the league, the ones who call the plays, are the ones who are passing the ball on early downs. And Todd Munkin is one who does that clearly more than anyone else. So it looks like it's going to be one of the more aggressive offenses in the NFL, led by a QB who's going to be a stud in Baker. We will have to see what happens with Munkin in the long run. I think he'll probably end up having a good year and then be plucked by another team to become the head coach. But um, I'm going to link a great article on draftace.com highlighting Munkin's play calling prowess, which will be linked in the description as well as in the blog post version of this video. Uh, So make sure you check that out and you can get a better idea of how the Browns offense will run this year. I love Baker. I absolutely love Nick Chubb this year. I think they need to bring on other weapons besides Jarvis Landry. I am going to be a little bit lower on him than other people are. I would probably take Antonio Callaway over Jarvis Landry because I like the aggressiveness of this offense. And I think he has a lot of big play potential and he's going to be drafted like 10 rounds later. So Cleveland, love what they're doing there. Love the coaching hires. And uh, let's move on. So the Denver Broncos... Clearly, they've been eating the pasta and watching the Sopranos. They hired a bunch of Itais, a bunch of Italians. Scangarello, Fangio, Supadello. So they bring over Vic Fangio as their head coach, who is a defensive-minded head coach. And as a Broncos fan, one, I mean, you got to be pumped up that Vance Joseph is finally out of there because he just fucking embarrassed you guys on national television more times than I than I even want to recall. Um, his play calling was absolutely out of control. Vic Fangio is a stud defensive mind in the NFL. This is his first stint as an NFL head coach. He's been in the league for a long time. He just he is coming over from the Chicago Bears. He was their defensive coordinator last year. Don't need to tell you how good they were as a defense, of course. Um, so he probably won't really be relied on much to run this offense. Now they hired Rich Scangarello. He was the former 49ers quarterbacks coach was with Kyle Shanahan in Atlanta and in San Francisco. He'll likely get the opportunity to kind of take full control of the offensive scheme here. Plus, they added Mike Munchak as their offensive line coach. Now, his offense, of course, is outdated, but it's definitely nice for have uh, for, for, for Skangy to have some, uh, some veteran experience there to help him on the offensive side of things. So, Rick Rich Scangarello, very much like all these other guys coming over from Sean McVay, is tied to the Shanahan tree. And if he can have any sort of success like Kyle Shanna and his, or if he brings that uh, style of offense over to the Broncos, it's going to be a good thing for their offense, right? They've got a pretty good offensive line, a really solid offensive line, actually. They just need to get a quarterback. Case Keenum's not going to get the job done there. Um, they have a great stable of running backs, decent weapons. We'll have to see what happens with uh, Emmanuel Sanders. It's going to be very tough for him to come back successfully, but they have a lot of young weapons, Um, If they can grab a quarterback, if they can either get someone through free agency or if they can draft someone high in uh, in the draft this year, I I, I think this could be a good move. But again, Scangarello is unproven from a coordinator or a coaching position. Um, So again, it's a risk, but it's like any of these NFL teams looking for the next shiny toy. Detroit Lions get rid of Jim Bob Cooter as their offensive coordinator. They hired Daryl Bevel as their new OC. He is the uh, ex-Seattle Seahawks offensive coordinator. Not last year, but the year prior. This is a a series of tweets from Graham Barfield. Highly recommend you follow him if you are on Twitter. Lions were the most pass-heavy team in the league. 63.3%. 
last year and averaged the eighth fewest plays per game, 62.6, with Jim Bob Cooter as the offensive coordinator. So they were passing a lot and they were a very slow paced team from 2015, 2018. This comes despite the fact that Detroit's offensive pace seconds between plays tanked in the span 22nd, 25th, 27th, 29th. Meanwhile, new Lions offensive coordinator Daryl Bevel calls the second most run heavy offense while in Seattle from 2011 to 2017. In this span, Seattle was the seventh most run heavy team inside the five yard line. This is very, very good news for carry on Johnson. So the Lions offense was miserable in 2018. Uh, some injuries, sure, but just bad, non-aggressive play calling, using LeGarrette Blunt over Karrion Johnson for the first half of the year. Like, it was really, 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 really bad. So Daryl Bevel takes over, and a lot of people hate this. He is literally the definition of a grounded pound. He was the OC during all of those beast mode years in Seattle. And you can take a look at his numbers here, a little chart I made up again. And the pass ratio to run ratio was pretty awful compared to most NFL teams in terms of, uh, you know, how heavy it was leaning towards the run. It actually it actually attempted more runs than they did passes for the first, uh, from 2012 to 2015, which is which is crazy. And then that started to go up a little bit as Russell Wilson became more of a vet in the league. But let's not forget the storyline of the Detroit Lions coming into 2018. A lot of people were excited about this team because they invested a lot of money in free agency and a lot of draft capital into their offensive line. People were like, they, they drafted Carrion Johnson. This is going to be a ground and pound team. We're excited to see them do this. It's going to be awesome. And now that, you know, 2018 became the year of the past, everyone's like, if you run the ball, you suck now, right? So I don't think this hire is actually going to be as bad as people think it's going to be. Because th this is me fading the public pretty much. Because everyone is getting on the bandwagon of the whole passing trend, which is obviously not just a trend. And it seems to be something that is going to be what the top offensive teams do. But... How Seattle showed us this year, you could be successful running the ball. And Detroit has a good offensive line. If they can give the ball more to carry on Johnson, as I expect they should, um, it's going to be a team that relies heavily on the ground. And I think they can be successful doing that. Looking at some of the ranks from Daryl Bevel's time in Seattle, or just his, his time overall in the league, pretty much. We had nine straight seasons where Bevel produced a top 12 fantasy running back as an offensive coordinator, both in Minnesota and Seattle. Nine straight seasons of a top of a running back one under him. That was from 2006 to 2014. The RB1 was a top four fantasy running back in seven of those nine seasons. Now things flipped from 2015 to 2017. That's when we saw Beast Mode leave. The Seattle running backs, you know, they took turns basically hitting the IR. Russell Wilson took control of the offense, so I don't look too much in, in, into that. But that chart, first of all, is on ffstatistics.com, a, a resource I already kind of mentioned earlier. It's a free website, and you can go to any coach and go to their history as either an offense coordinator or head coach and look at fantasy ranks for any position, which is an awesome tool. So I'll link that down below as well. But Detroit is clearly becoming a team that wants to run the ball. Bevel is a guy who knows how to do that, and he's had success doing that. It's probably not a great thing for Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones as the average wide receiver one finish over those 12 years with Bevel as an offensive coordinator was wide receiver 33. So the best fantasy wide receiver in those offenses averaged a wide receiver 33 finish. There was one finish at wide receiver 17 or better. The wide receiver two, forget about it. Those averages were horrible. Um, now Baldwin did have three big years as a fantasy wide receiver in Bevel's offense. So I'm not going to completely throw that out, but I feel like that was more of a Russell Wilson throwing to Doug Baldwin kind of thing. And it wasn't like a high volume, high target thing. Baldwin just was very efficient on his targets, slot receiver, getting a lot of looks, not expecting that from anyone in the Detroit passing offense. Love carry on Johnson this year. I think he has a monster breakout year. So Detroit Lions, Daryl Bevel, Green Bay Packers fired Mike McCarthy midway through or, you know, four, I think four games remaining in the 2018 campaign. The higher Matt LaFleur is the head coach. I really hate this move. And the reason I hate it is because they have Aaron Rodgers. So they probably could have hired just about anyone they wanted to. They wanted to get Bruce Arians, but maybe he actually didn't want to come. But so outside of him, I'd imagine that coaching job was the most relished one, maybe outside of Cleveland as well. Now, Matt LaFleur was the quarterback's coach for the Redskins from 2010 to 2013 during RG3's monster 2012 rookie year. He was the quarterback coach in Atlanta for 2015 and 2016 during Matt Ryan's MVP season. He becomes the offensive coordinator of the Rams during 2017, which was the highest scoring offense in the NFL. But that was McVay's offense. That was not Matt LaFleur 
calling plays. He moves over to Tennessee last year as the offensive coordinator, and he calls plays in 2018, and then he signs with the Packers as their head coach. Very, very hard to gauge what we're going to expect from Matt LaFleur this year. If you look at his resume, a lot of those things are impressive, right? RG3 during his rookie year, Matt Ryan MVP, the Rams during 2017. However, quarterbacks coach, how much does that really account for a quarterback's big year? You're going to give that credit to you know, the offense coordinator, as well as the head coach. It's like, how, how many people really had a big impact on that? Matt Ryan, that was also under Kyle Shanahan when Matt Ryan had his big year. McVay was the one calling plays, so it's very hard to gauge it. Um, but at least we're going to get a lot of modern concepts here out of Matt LaFleur. He was under Shanahan in Atlanta, McVay in LA. And you look at this Tennessee team <clears throat> in 2018, they use a lot of play action. And that's, uh, that's a good sign of uh, an offensive-minded coach who is a little bit more forward-thinking. And he did pretty well considering just how banged up Mariota was throughout most of the year. He was able to win games with Blaine Gabbert. So, I mean, that's not, you know, that, that's not the worst thing. I think realistically, Green Bay just didn't want to, it's almost like Aaron Rodgers is like LeBron James, where you just want to put a head coach there that doesn't get in the way, that doesn't piss him off, that lets him kind of run his own offense and, and not clash heads with him. So Rodgers, has got to be happy with this hire. He was done with Mike McCarthy. So uh, what to expect here? I don't really know. I still love Aaron Rodgers in fantasy. I still love Devonta Adams in fantasy this year. The running back situation is going to be very hard to tell. We saw, you know, the Titans use a ton of splits between Derrick Henry, uh, Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis this year. So we might see something similar between Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams. It just seems like Green Bay is not insistent on being um, or, or having Aaron Jones as the main guy there. For as good as he is and as good as he's been, Everyone knows he's the best running back there. I'm not arguing that point, but it just doesn't seem like the Packers want to commit to Aaron Jones. Nathaniel Hackett was hired as the offensive coordinator for the Packers. He has a lot of play calling experience. He produced some good years out of Blake Borrell statistically. Um, he got fired this year, but I don't think that was really his fault. Jacksonville had a fucking 78 different fires to put out. So it should be interesting in Green Bay to see what happens. Speaking of Jacksonville, they had Nathaniel Hackett as their offensive coordinator. They are insistent on staying with Doug Marone as their head coach. Um, a year removed from that dynamite top five scoring offensive campaign in 2017. There's one solution to the Jaguars offense, right? There's one There's one problem and one solution only. It starts with BL and it ends with Ake Bortles being their quarterback. Outside of a major move at who is throwing the ball from under center, I don't see much changing in Jacksonville. It's all but a certainty that Blake Bortles is not going to be the guy there in 20, uh, 2019. They have the odds for Nick Foles being in Jacksonville at plus 350. So I think that's a very realistic possibility. They uh, they hire John DiFilippo as their offensive coordinator who rejoins Tom Coughlin after working with him in New York. Now DiFilippo had gotten a lot of praise prior to how this year ended in Minnesota. This will be his third NFL team coordinating the offensive for the offense for. He was Cleveland's offensive coordinator in 2015 and was the quarterback's coach in Philly last year, 2017 I should say. Um, and was said to be a big part of Wentz's and Foles' success. Not sure how much I buy into that again. Listen, like everyone keeps saying how much quarterback coaches affect these quarterbacks. I, like, eh, I don't know. I, I, do you agree with that? Leave a comment down below. Let me know what your point of view on on those kind of things are. Where like every every part of that offensive coaching staff seems to get credit for a quarterback having a good year. I kind of hate that shit. So we'll have to see what happens um, there. We'll get another run in Jacksonville. Roto World thinks everything is lining up for the Foles move to Jacksonville, as I kind of just touched on, which would actually make sense, and it would reunite Foles, considering they, they worked together in Philadelphia and had that really big year. He'll have to convince Coughlin to move away from that run-heavy approach if we want them to see statistical, statistical success in 2019. They do have weapons on the outside, man. D.D. Westbrook, Marquise Lee returning, Keelan Cole, um... DJ Chark maybe deciding to fuck around, possibly make an impact on this offense. So a real NFL quarterback like Nick Foles would put the Jags in place to be one of the comeback teams of comeback teams of the year in 2019. So it's, it's kind of interesting there. Miami Dolphins, man, they get rid of Adam Gase. Thank God they are hiring the Pats linebacker coach Brian Flores. At least uh, once the Super Bowl is finished, they're having a meeting with him during the Super Bowl week. They will hire him after the Super Bowl. Brian Flores, man, quote-unquote, has a reputation for being an energetic, demanding, and hard-nosed coach. Dolphins wanted to go with the defensive-minded coach no matter what here, looking at the other names that they interviewed on their interview list, all defensive-minded coaches. So that's the way they were thinking. That's the way this, this, this team is going to be set up in 2019. This is just as bad uh, of a situation overall as just about any team in the NFL. Their personnel 
is awful. The only thing that I'm kind of remotely excited about is having Gaze gone means maybe Kenyon Drake will get a chance to get that workload as a, as a feature back, but that's far from a guarantee. Um, I just hate this this Dolphin situation overall. It's probably the most disgusting outlook from a fantasy perspective in the NFL. Who over to the Minnesota Vikings, who I said uh, John DiFilippo is gone as OC. Kevin Stefanski took over as the interim offense coordinator when DiFilippo got fired in Week 15 last year. Over those last three games, Minnesota went 2-1. and one. They removed the interim tag from Stefanski, and he will be the permanent offensive coordinator in 2019. Over those last three games, the uh, <coughs> the Vikings ran the ball on 48% of their plays, which was the eighth highest rate in the NFL, compared to just 35.5% of the time over the course of the entire season, which was the fourth lowest rate in the NFL. So Mike Zimmer, Stefanski wants to run the ball and be a defensive-minded team. They pass the ball a lot over the course of the entire season, but those last three games under Stefanski were extremely run-heavy. Only Green Bay, Pittsburgh, and Atlanta ran the ball at a lower rate last year than the Vikings did over the course of the season. They also hired Gary Kubiak as the offensive advisor. It's a confusing situation. I'm not really sure what it means. But again, Mike Zimmer, Stefanski want to be a run first team. If Dalvin Cook can stay healthy, he's going to absolutely shine. But of course, that's going to be the problem here. What does it mean for Diggs and Thielen? I think they're both going to get theirs. I would think both of them are in that high-end wide receiver two range. Uh, we got a few more. Let's see what uh, what else we got going on here. The New York Jets. Jesus fucking Christ, New York, man. This is the most New York Jets move I've ever seen. Get rid of Todd Bowles, which was a good move. But they hire Adam Gase, man. He is so fucking bad as a head coach. I don't. You can make as many excuses as you want for him in Miami, but he showed zero results. Zero results. Why do you want to keep hyping up a guy who hasn't shown anything? It doesn't make sense. Um, inside the locker room, people do not like him. Players do not like him. He should be. He's one of those guys who should be an offensive coordinator, not a head coach. Lots of problems off the field. Now he's moving to New York like they are unforgiving in that media. If a player is performing well, the fans and the media are going to side with that player over Adam Gase. I'm not even going to get into that fucking press conference. That was just, that was like non-human. That was alien-like. I don't know what fucking species Adam Gase is. But I want to look back at Adam Gase's time as the head coach in Miami. Um, it may have been one of the worst situations to have been in. You know, in the NFL as a head coach, I understand Ryan Tannehill wasn't healthy. But still, man, look at these numbers. 2018, 2017, 2016. Awful in just about every single category. Football Outsiders DVOA, which is just their efficiency metric overall. Yards per drive, points per drive, plays per drive, time of possession per drive, drive success rate. Basically bottom five or bottom ten in every category for three straight years. Adam Gates brought over Dole. La I'm not even sure how to say this, to be honest with you. Dole, Dowell, Dole, Logains, Lagains. There's about 17 different ways I could pronounce that. They all end with the same result, and that's being a terrible fucking offense coordinator. He's coming over from Miami. Gates will call the plays. Nothing major here. If I'm looking at the running back situation, Gates does not know how to evaluate talent there. Clearly, he did not play Kenyon Drake. He did not play Damian Williams last year. Um... He insisted on playing Frank Gore over him. So we'll have to see what happens in New York in the backfield. I think Crowell is a free agent. I would like to see Elijah McGuire get his crack at getting, you know, a 15 plus touch workload um, there. If he could start the year as, as the starter, he is going to be a, a pretty big time sleeper, I think, for New York. In terms of the weapons on the outside, I don't know what this is going to do to Donald, to be honest with you. Uh, I like Robbie Anderson a lot. They did just re-sign Quincy Nunwa to an extension. So... I, I want to hear what happens throughout the summer, but I'm definitely not high on this offense whatsoever. Pittsburgh Steelers, now they didn't make any major moves, um, but one thing I did want to point out, this is Curtis Patrick tweeted this out. Well, Ian Rappaport reported it first. The Steelers are expected to hire NC State tight ends, fullbacks coach, and special teams coordinator Ed Faulkner as their new running backs coach. Um, a hire from an un unexpected place to work with James Conner and others. Curtis Patrick pointed out, how can you share this and not mention Jalen Samuels, who was the former NC State offensive weapon that Faulkner, this new hire for the Steelers, deployed Samuels in a manner that led to 202 career receptions. Depending on what happens in Pittsburgh, if Antonio Brown is gone, there's going to be a lot of targets up for grabs. I also am not sure how much they're going to rely on James Conner in the passing game last year, right? He was the workhorse over the very long majority of the year. But he got hurt at the end of the year, and that's the second time in two years where he's had a lower leg injury that cost him multiple games. He came back in Week 17, and Jalen Samuels still saw, I believe it was eight targets and caught seven of them. So he was still very involved in the passing game. Now with this new 
a uh, coach coming over who used Jalen Samuels extremely heavily in college. I could see Jalen Samuels, maybe he won't even be in the backfield, but this could be a committee as well as Jalen Samuels moving around the backfield or moving around the formation as a tight end or just in the slot or something like that. A very good receiver, of course. So he's someone that you might want to buy low in in dynasty leagues because you don't know how that's going to uh, play out. The last coach that we're going to bring up is Bruce Arians of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They fired Dirk Cutter, who went to Atlanta as the OC. Todd Munkin is now the OC in Cleveland. Now, the Bucs acquired Bruce Arians and a 2019 seventh round pick from the Cardinals in exchange for a 2019 sixth round pick. It was actually a trade, which is weird. He's retired. I don't really know how that fuck that works, but who cares? This should be a fun one, right? Bruce Arians was the formal uh, former Cardinals head coach who kind of revived Carson Palmer's career, as so to say. The Bucks roster is one that on paper should score points at will, led by Jameis Winston. He is the quarterback that needs a resurrection. He needs some guidance in his career. Tampa has ranked ninth and third in offensive yards per game over the last two seasons, respectively. Obviously, Arians was not coming out of retirement unless he really, really, really felt like and he truly believed in the quarterback situation that he was coming over to. He was not going to you know, start coaching again on a team that was rebuilding. He obviously sees a lot of potential in Jameis Winston. And, you know, he's here to have them reach that potential that I think they should reach based on what they look like on paper. Winston is, you know, literally, he just turned 25 this month, and he is he has had some big years already. He's been in the league for, I think this will be his fifth year. Now, after two 4,000-yard passing seasons to start his career, he hasn't been able to stay on the field uh, in the two years following. But his passing yards per game, as well as his completion percentages, have gone up in all four years. So, even if you think he's very sporadic, he has been improving year over year. Passing yards per game have gone up each year. Completion percentage have gone up each year. Now, this is a, an aggressive vertical offense. Bruce Arians was, like I said, the head coach in Arizona from 2013 to 2017. During those five seasons, here is the passing rate of his offenses and their NFL rank. 2013, 59.3% passing rate, 15th in the NFL. 2014, 60.4%, 14th in the NFL. 2015, Dropped down to 58%, which was 22nd, but that was a year in which they went 13-3 and three with an average point differential in their wins of 17 points. So no need to pass the ball a lot there. 2016, passed the ball on 63.3% of their plays, tied for 5th in the NFL. 2017, 61.3% of their plays, tied for 7th in the NFL. So I'm not actually sure who's going to be calling the plays here, unfortunately. He originally said he was, then he wasn't. Um, they also brought in Byron Lefwich to play the OC role and might be their Arian's predecessor in a couple of years, but I hope he plays. I hope he calls the plays and not Le- Leftwich. I did not like what I saw from Leftwich after he came on to call the plays for the Cardinals last year. A lot of people got excited because David Johnson had like fucking four receptions in the first game that Byron Leftwich took over, but he was still shoving David Johnson up the middle on first down runs all the time. I like what they did here in, in Tampa Bay. They brought Todd Bowles on as defensive coordinator, which is again. Not a good head coach, but he is someone who I think is a very good defensive coordinator. I will be drafting Jameis Winston heavily in fantasy leagues this year. He will be someone who people are not high on. They think he's probably done. Um, They think he's too turnover prone, whatever. The numbers are there. The passing yards are there. The touchdowns are going to be there with Arians. Arians has done it with Palmer. He's going to do it with Jameis Winston. Um, I really like what this means for Mike Evans because you could look back uh, at what the wide receiver one did in those Bruce Arians offenses and they get targeted a ton. I love what this means. We'll have to see what happens with Deshaun Jackson if he decides to come back on the team because he uh, he wasn't really sure. But now that Bruce Arians is signed on, maybe that changes his mind a little bit. I kind of hope not just because I would love to see Chris Godwin play the full-time wide receiver two role. I think he could be an absolute monster breakout candidate in 2019. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. We'll have to see. You know, Bruce Arians loves to use a workhorse in his um, offense in terms of running backs. I don't think Peyton Barber or Rojo are either going to be a workhorse. <clears throat> so that came out ridiculously. I don't think either of them are going to be the workhorse. I don't think he's going to rely on either of them. So the starter might not even be on the roster right now. We'll have to see a lot of running backs in free agency this year. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. Other notes, uh, Cowboys offensive coordinator Scott Linehan was fired last week. This will open up more play calling opportunities for Jason Garrett to the delight of many Giants, Eagles, and Redskins fans around the world. Um, They haven't hired a new offensive coordinator yet, but they may promote tight ends coach Doug Neusmeyer, I believe, which was the report, which is the same thing that the Titans did once Matt LaFleur bounced. Uh, Tennessee promoted from within their tight ends coach, Arthur Smith, to offensive coordinator. I don't know why all these tight end coaches are being promoted to offensive coordinator, why that's a popular thing, but the Bengals, Cardinals, and Jets still need to 
fill their offensive coordinator vacancy. I believe that was a note I put in way prior to this happening because the Bengals brought on Brian Callahan, Cardinals, Byron Lefwich, Jets, Dole Logans, however you say that. So that's going to wrap up the coach speak, bro. I, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, of course, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. If you're listening via podcast, uh, rating and review would be very, very, very much appreciated as always. Um, leave some comments down below. Any questions you might have, subscribe to the channel. If you are new, we'll be hitting you with fantasy football content all winter, spring, and summer long leading up to your drafts and then throughout the season, baby. It's Big Dogs Got A Fantasy Football. We'll see y'all next time. Peace. Thank you.